Well, this month we have a very special guest that's going to join us here if he hasn't joined back in yet. And uh, that's Jack McElroy. And you, most of you uh, probably know Jack from uh, other club activities that Jack and his family have been involved in. But uh, this one's kind of special. So uh, I'm not going to waste a lot of time telling you what the preview is. Jack can do it all. And uh, We'll just let it go from that. Jack, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Uh, thanks for introducing me. Well, I'm going to stop sharing, and you should be able to take off. So okay. go ahead. Show's all yours. All right. Okay. So this is the Spring Equinox 2021 balloon race. So the Spring Equinox 20, 2021 Balloon Race is um, we choose camera projects that teach STEM. Uh, it's science, technology, engineering, and math. So we look at a uh, balloon and ballooning HABs. Pico says as a way to learn physics by using two meters or twenty meters to track a balloon. Some uh, some of our ham radio for, ham radio ballooning friends we have around the world organize a world. A wide balloon launch to celebrate spring uh, called the Spring Equinox 2021 Balloon Race. And we're all flying a PicoSat balloon. And for me, balloons and satellites are ham radio STEM activities as they involve all four parts science, uh, with, like studying the atmosphere or propagation of the PicoSat, technology involving building your payload if you're making one for like a big latex balloon, um, engineering if you're um, uh, building the balloon, connecting um, all the strings, uh, planning it out on a board, what your, what your design is going to be, calculating if it's going to be um, going to be airworthy in the air and it's not going to sink down to the ocean. In math, because you're studying and calculating its buoyancy force, its uh, rate of lift. And so that's why I'm talking to you tonight about STEM activity using ham radio. So first of all, as I said before, a PicoSat, and you may be uh, wondering what is a PicoSat balloon? Well, a PicoSat balloon um, example is the balloon that is flying over the Middle East right now is an SBS-13 or Scientific Balloon Solutions-13 balloon made by the same company. And a payload on this balloon is a solar-powered sky tracker made by Bill Brown, WB8ELK. He's a great friend of ours and uh, he supplies us with lots of with PicoSats and lots of advice and knowledge about um, HEBs and PicoSats. The balloon was made to fly around 13 kilometers, uh, hence the name, and is a super pressure balloon. And I'll go into what a super pressure balloon is later in the presentation. So you, so you may be asking why 13 kilometers or 41,000 feet? While most rooms are below 13 kilometers, I believe about 81%. So far, we've made two trips around the world in the springtime, and we have not been hit by any storms in our two circumnavigations of the Earth. And so in the graph below, you can see how the developing and dissipating stage of major storms don't even get close to the 13 kilometer mark, only at the very peak of mature stage of a storm that a very rare peak can occur and get up to the altitude of 13 kilometers, but that's really rare. So most time we stay above that, um, those storms. But as you see to the right, the temperature in Celsius, if we get up to high enough temperatures and the storm affects us, water can develop and it'll ice up ice up causing us to go down an altitude through the storm and cause us to um, go for a defrost cycle and go up but keep on going uh, down and back up and down back up until we finally reach the ground and the balloon is lost. So how do you get to 13 kilometers but no higher? Well it's most important part is ham radio project and since you, as I said before, you need to fly higher than the storms, most storms at 12, 12 kilometers, but not so high that the pressure is so low that you overstress a balloon envelope or just a balloon. And you gotta remember that the envelope that the envelope will inflate fully once it once it reaches the 13 kilometer or 41,000 um my, uh, uh 41,000 feet mark, and it'll just um go a little bit higher, a little bit lower than that altitude, and it'll pretty much stay the same. Um, inflation, but it will not stress pressure differential. It can rip open. 
and it it will go down um, really quickly. And understanding the laws of buoyancy and the careful attention to detail to key to success, as it can as details everything in this. Uh, the you you gotta pay attention to all the wear in your balloon, whether that be the tape, the payload, the string. Um, and also you got to know what's the wind going to be, uh, what's the weather um, in the Atlantic Ocean, what's the prime time to launch, um, when is when is there going to be like stormy clouds, when is it going to be clear, all of that. And so, uh, as you you have to know a bit of math and the physics of buoyancy, which I'll explain with a few diagrams. Um, so, buoyancy is a force like any other force, like... Uh, pushing someone or a vase falling off a counter. And buoyancy is related to pressure and relative density of two more objects. And Archimedes principle says that objects with lower density will be buoyant. So if you put like a beach ball and you push it underwater, it'll come back up. But if you push, but if you drop an anvil into water, it's going to sink. And so the atmosphere becomes less dense with altitude. And the buoyant force is created by the helium gas uh, helium gas weight or hydrogen gas, if you're using that in the balloon, and the volume contained in the balloon is, is less than the surrounding atmosphere air. And so that's going to be determined once it reaches the 13 kilometer mark, not uh, as compared to lower at ground level. So the reason this, this process, of, process of expansion stops is because the balloon cannot stretch. And the reason why is because there's a special film on it called Heptax, which is a Japanese-made film, which is a derivative of the American-made film called PET, or BEPT film, that was used on the first uh, really large um, high-altitude balloons, you can call them, that went around the world studying uh, weather and all of that. And a good example is the one to her right. That is a newer image, but the balloons, like used in the 60s and 70s, used that PET film. And so once it reaches 13 kilometers, it's going to become a rigid structure and it's going to look much different than what you see on the ground when it's first inflated because the pressure is going to change inside the balloon to, to equalize the pressure outside. And so as a result, the, the balloon's going to expand and look much more filled up like the balloons you see at Kroger's or Walmart. And since the, ver since the polymer, much like a large trash bag in that once is inflated, it cannot inflate anymore. So, but that's different for, like, say, a latex balloon. Is this why these parts um, have ballooning and ham radio really teach physics uh, really well to people? As ballooning is a simple and really fun way to give people the ham radio and also teach them a good bit about math and physics at a young age. So here's the buoyancy math. And basically, th this math we used um, in our Yoda presentation a year ago. So it's, it's going to be different uh, numbers for the variables because we're using a Qualtex or Mylar balloon for this uh, equation. But it's all going to be, um, it's just all going to be the same exact stuff with a uh, SBS balloon, just different numbers. So you, you, uh, with all the variables, I'm just going to glance over this. It's going to be the mass of the balloon, the volume of the balloon, density of the helium or hydrogen, if you're filling the balloon up with hydrogen, density of the air, and you have to determine the total mass that can be lifted by the, by the helium or hydrogen balloon. And so what you'll have to do is you'll multiply the volume of the balloon times the density of the air. And so that will equal to the mass. And so that total amount can be lifted, uh, in this case of the equation, uh, 0 0.13 kilograms, including the balloon, the helium, payload, uh, string, tape on the balloon, all of that. And you have to turn the mass as displaced, um, and you have to turn the mass of the helium or the hydrogen. And so with that, you'll get the volume of the balloon, and you'll multiply that by the density of helium, and you'll get, um, in this case, 0 0.018 kilograms. And you subtract that from the mass of the balloon and the mass of the um, volume of the helium, the total mass that can be lifted, and it'll turn the force required to lift displaced volume. So, um, yeah, here's one of our pictures from the Yo presentation, just uh, me and Audrey. Um, in our video to them, and uh, in this video, we went over the PicoSat, um, how to fill up a balloon, how the balloon works, and all of that. And you may be asking, why not use latex party balloons and latex weather balloons? Well, they follow Archimedes' principle when filled with a light gas like helium or hydrogen. 
And the problem is, Latex just keeps on getting bigger and bigger until it pops. And that's the thing with, like, on the shows like Storm Chasers, how they have those big latex balloons and they release them. Those latex balloons don't stay parked at out to, like, 13 kilometers, and they just keep on going up and up and up until they eventually pop at an altitude of, like, 100,000 feet. And so the SPS-14 balloon, you may be wondering what it looks like, and this is what it looks like. It's uh, full in half in this picture, and mirror sticks are being used to measure it. So you can imagine what... It looked like inflated, inflated on the ground, and eventually completely um, full looking in uh, 13 kilometers. And so uh, you have to use good laboratory practice. You got to follow good safety procedure on inflating the balloon, especially if you're using hydrogen. And here's just my sister inflating the SBS 13 balloon that we are that we uh, launched recently. And the most important part is where we combine the physics theory with hands-on lab work. So in this situation, the balloon is tethered to a 50 gram cylindrical weight. And the weight of the balloon, the helium, the string, the tape, the 20 meter dipole antenna, sky tracker, um, are all summed in called W's. And you gotta account for everything, no matter how small or how big it is, because it can matter between your balloon landing in the Atlantic Ocean right when you launched it, or a balloon going around the world. So we added the helium and inflate the balloon as you monitor the buoyant force exerted on the cylindrical 50 gram, 50 gram weight on the scale. Where buoyant lift the balloon has the less apparent weight of the 50 gram cylinder is measured by the scale. And we carefully inflate until we get about 6.33 grams of free lift. And that's just enough so the balloon doesn't go flying off uh, into nowhere, but it's enough so the balloon doesn't just go down or just stay um or just say, yeah, just go down and hit the ground and not go up. So here's the balloon fully inflated and it has about 6.33 grams of positive love, as I said before. And right in that picture, it's better picture is go for a laser takeoff. And right there is it fully inflated. And it looks not much, but trust me, once it gets up to the 13 kilometers, it looks much bigger. So here's a uh, even better picture of balloon um, almost, um, uh, just taped together so it's in a smaller form and this is from a few years ago and it's fully inflated and a good tip is to when you're is to launch in the dark or really early in the morning because the lack of wind and the solar heating and that's that's the problem we face during like launching during midday that's the reason why our balloons would go down into the atlantic ocean because the storms because the winds are much higher um as compared to during midday as compared to at night when there's pretty much zero wind and um you may, may be wondering why I can reach this high, and it's because in the words of Isaac Newton, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And in particular, the work done at NCAR, the National Center of Atmospheric Research in the 60s. And the NCAR program uh, had a program called the Global Horizontal Sounding Technique, or GHOST. And this program, the GHOST program, was headed by one, one of our guiding lights, um, Vincent E. Lally, who made tons of successful balloons and one of his balloons even went for two years and all his balloons he launched from Christchurch, New Zealand and he had a very very interesting way of tracking the balloons and you can even see that tracking device on the on the picture to the right of the solar sensors of how he tracked it with the um, degrees of elevation so uh, I would love to go into that but um, I'll continue on so because this the project is the project this project is in honor of Mr. Vincent E. Lolly. So here's a photograph of the super pressure balloon at float altitude. Granted, it's not ours, but this is courtesy of NASA. And it's this balloon is much more spherical than ours. Ours are look more elongated at the top, but as you can see, it's much more inflated once it reaches the uh, 13 kilometers altitude, as compared to down on the ground. And so it becomes a much more rigid structure at the 13 kilometer altitude. And here is the launch video of the CAM4ZI-3, uh, the balloon flying right now, the Midnight Rider on 20th of March, 2021. Thank you. 
Jen. And we got Mom over there helping. What's your call sign, Jen? K4CR. And I'm the B4SDR. And KM4ZIA is right up there sleeping. He's sound asleep. He's been a hard working boy all day. So we're about to launch our super pressure balloon. Yes, Bill Brown, Whisper Factor. Bill Brown, WV8, ELK. Thank you, buddy. And here we go. Yeah. Gonna give a countdown, Jen. Let it go and it goes. She's going straight up. It's a perfect lunch. So uh, you may be wondering how we collect information about how the balloon's doing um, throughout its flight. And this is called the flight telemetry data. And the payload is, a, the, of course, the PicoSat Sky Tracker, which broadcasts telemetry in Whisper packets. And Whisper means weak signal propagation reporting net packets on 20 meters. And the antenna we're using right now on the balloon is a 20 meter vertical halfway dipole, a half wave dipole. And Whisper packets are stored on a global database on the Whisper site. And Bull Brown, WBA ELK, he gave us a Python script, Python script that interrogates the Whisper database, finds your call sign, and gets the data that it comes from the balloon, and then puts that data into APRS, and it shows where you are on the APRS.fi map. And you can't just immediately load into APRS since APRS is Used for twenty for used for two meter um, antennas and transmissions, while Whisper is used for twenty meter. So here's the path taken by uh, came for zi dash free, and this is on APRS.fi, and APRS means IMAC Packet Reporting System. And so here you can see its path that is taken, um, and right now, and it is flying over Algeria, Algeria at that time. And you can notice how it's flying at 61 miles per hour on the white box, right box, and its altitude is 41,338 feet. And you can see below that how it's running 4.7 uh, volts. Of course, it's much less than that. And so it's in that, and also the date and time. And APRS also has a really good feature how you can uh, look at Street View of under your balloon balloon uh, path. And so of course it's not real time images from the balloon. You can but you can get a general sense of what's what your balloon's going over. And there in the picture in the top left, that's actually where they filmed the site of the first Star Wars movie and New Hope in Tatooine. And then here is um because that doesn't take pictures, you can look at the map and street view as I said before in the under, in the under the balloon path. And here's another image of that right over where the balloon flew over, or where they actually filmed the town in A New Hope. So, saying, so saying the, uh, the balloon around the world not only teaches people about the atmosphere and radio, uh, how the balloon works. PicoSat, but also teaches about geography and our cultures. And this is a picture taken in Turkmenistan of a, a mother and her son. Here's a picture from the Himalayan mounds in Tibet on the other side of Himalayan mounds. And here is in the foothills of Nepal. And so uh, this is over Turkmenistan again. So the balloon flew over many places, like I believe this mock, uh, mosque, and flew about 41,000 feet, as you can see, so about 13 kilometers. And of course, uh, as I said before, H uh, not HEBs, but PicoSats is a great way to have kids to learn more about ham radio, get them into ham radio, interested into it, as well as teaching them basic f physics and more math than just what they're learning in school. So another tracking site is called Habweb Tracker, and it shows the complete history of the flight. It also provides re reliable info about HEBs and ATS here, and I'll actually show you um, all three sites right now. So first is APRS.fi, and here's the current path that the balloon has taken taken so far. So you can see how it is flying uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. It's about to go over Portugal and Spain, 
and there's this packet. So it's the date, the time, how fast it's flying, its altitude, so about 40,000, about 41,000 feet, it's telemetry data, its uh, voltage, um, all of that. And then here in HabHub, you had the packet as well, but we went to high split. And this shows the predicted path of the balloon. So this is a really good uh, feature that shows where the, balloon, where the balloon's path might take from NOAA predictions that HabHub has used. So you can see the red is the, is the past uh, path that the balloon has taken. And the, see if I can zoom in, the blue, green, and red paths are all differing paths that the balloon could take across the world. And most of the time these predictions are very much right and the predictions are correct. And here's Whisper. And it's hard to see through all of the call signs, but right there over Atlantic Ocean is cam 4 zia 3 And you see all the lines coming from it are stations that it's being picked up by. So you can see by it is being picked up in Turkey, is being picked up in Italy, uh, uh, the UK, Norway, Sweden, uh, Europe, uh, France, Germany, all those countries. And all the way down here, it's being picked up by Little Tiny Island, Great Barrier Reef, the Coral Islands, in Australia. So it's just really cool how how Whisper shows you all this and how cool these stations are that they can pick you up from this far away. So here's Whisper and here's it and here's Whisper again. And Whisper also is really cool because it teaches you about the gray line for Earth. And so it's a good way for like kids to understand how, how what it is and it really shows you that the sun really dictates everything that will happen. Whatever your balloon will transmit, whatever your balloon will die um, and wake up in a couple hours. It just really shows how you're not the true one in power. And here's a image of came for zia came for ZIA-3 after it passed over South Korea and is over the Sea of Japan. And it's being picked up by JH1 ARY and J JS6 U UEY on uh, off the archipelago of Japan. So it's really cool. And here's another path prediction model by HabHub, the HabHub tracker from the NOAA. And we have this program WSJT-X, and my sister was able to decode uh, decode what. Uh, they killed my balloon whisper te telemetry on the 20 on 20 meters as it was over Abilene, Texas in the WSJT-X program went ran by a good friend, Joe Taylor, who is a Nobel Prize laureate in astrophysics and specifically pulsar detection in outer space. And my name is Jack McElroy, came for ZIA and, and came for ZIA and this is him ready for me in 2021. Well, Jack, that was uh, spectacular, and uh, I got a couple of questions for you, and I'm sure, sure some other folks do. Uh, if you could go back to the telemetry page, just pick any one. Uh, there's a item on there that's noted as SAT, and it says it has 12 of them. What is that? Uh so, uh, so which which page there was you it? Go. Pick pick one with the uh, telemetry information on it. Okay. So right here. Yeah. See where it says twelve sats right under thirty two miles an hour. Uh yes, the uh twelve. Yes, so that just shows that it is being picked up by uh twelve um, uh, it's being picked up by twelve satellites uh in the outer space and it's being yeah it's being it's being locked on to those with a gps and that's it's also being it's showing its live location with that so that's what the 12 sats means ah very good thank you hey jack this is tom in woodstock kj4 ajx this is tremendous what you and your sister have done i'm very impressed 
And I just want to share with you, my dad was a meteorologist. Uh, he retired in the, in the 60s, but he was doing balloons for meteorology research in Southern California. And I'd be really curious what kind of material he was using for his balloons. But that's, that's just anecdotal information for you. Again, I'm really impressed by what you did. Great job. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, he, he um, actually one of the first sharpers that the that uh, law meteorologist used was a sun sensor that basically detected the uh, the angle, angle of sun, um, and currently where where the balloon was, and with that it could triangulate the location on Earth, and there's an accurate way to show the location of the of the balloon and with that the the sun basically uh let the balloon know uh morse could send out and its rate sent out with the packet info back to uh where the team was back in Christchurch. so um yeah this is before gps so you didn't have like this fancy uh picosat right here that i have um, you see all the circuits and you see the solar panels that it runs off of. So, awesome. yeah, and, and that may have been what your dad was been what was using, uh, may have been not, but that's um, from the ghost program. For ghost program, that's what they're yeah, using. Yeah, and I think what he was studying was air pressure and temperature and barometric pressure. So, well, thanks again. Very cool. Yeah. There's another question, Jack. The Pico stat, did you and Audrey actually have to assemble it or did it? Did it come from uh, W eight uh, all put together? Well, um, actually, I have Audrey here, and she wants to answer it. Yeah, hello. Hi, hey, Audrey. Okay, so uh, currently we're actually working with Bill Brown. So the first few we received were pre-built by him, almost. Uh, the Whisper ones, though, we did have to attach the antennas to and make sure they were cut to length and do all that jazz, which is not easy to do. Because, you know, that thing's suspended in the air and you're making sure that the antenna doesn't rip off and like, ooh. 32 so, gauge maggot wire. Yeah. So um, with the APRS ones, there's a lot less setup because you're only using the two meter antenna. But um, we're actually working with him. We're going to probably start assembling the boards for him at some point just because he's a NASA engineer and the, uh, the demand for these things is going up. So we'll probably help him out with that. Yes. Yeah. That's so. great. So uh, how many of these balloons are actually in orbit right now? Is there a way to tell? Uh, yeah, there is. So um, uh, if you go on to Hab Hub, I can tell you off the top of my head how many I know. I know that ours is still up, obviously. Um, you can bring it up. UAH is still up. University of Alabama at Huntsville, which is Bill Brown. Uh, theirs is still up. And I think actually those are the only two left in spring equinox launch. Um, a lot of them got caught in a really bad storm up in what, like northern northern Europe. Um, up in like skin, like yeah. Well, what? Yeah, what, what happened to one balloon was it basically went all all the way over North Pole and it was lost. Yeah. And then two balloons were going over the Pacific Ocean, I believe, and they're going to go over like Argentina, but they were lost. And they disappeared. And then a couple of them had leaks. Yes. So and they just slowly went down. And the frosting, what I talked about before for the defrost, uh, the defrost cycles, that actually happened to one balloon, and it iced up and just kept on going down, down until it hit the ground. Yep. So. Yeah, we're the one of the last two standing. Real lucky at the moment. Very lucky. Well, congratulations. It's uh, very cool. Very cool. Thank you. And congratulations, guys, and very good, Jack, on the presentation. It was really nice. Um, I, I don't know if everybody knows. It's pretty obvious, but if you go to the nfarl.org website, it's right at the top of the homepage with a button to click on and see where it is right now. That's how I find it, and it's uh, very interesting to see uh, where it is and how many times it's been around and all that kind of thing so on the narfl.org website. So but, Jack, uh, yeah. You actually launched this thing a month ago, right? Yeah, we did. Just yep. about a month ago, March 20th. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch. And the best part is, I don't know if you mentioned this, but when it goes over some foreign country, you turn on street view and it, it'll let you do a street view either at its location or the nearest street view location. So you can see pretty much where it is, mm -hmm. wow, you know? So cool. we had to fly over some interesting, I would say points of interest. What It went, it went over the DMZ. I it went like right under Korea. DMZ uh, in South Korea. Yeah, it went right over there. 
And uh, rumor is it went over Area 51. It flew directly <laughs> over White Sands. Yeah. Dur yeah. yeah. Directly so. over White Sands. I, and I, I bet they probably already knew it was there. It's not worth their time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so, tell you uh, what, it's, uh, it's certainly interesting to watch the thing. I mean, I've been tracking it pretty much every day for the last couple of weeks. So, yeah. I'm amazed. Yeah, you know, you were talking about the, um, the the street views. One of the interesting things that I've found uh, about your balloon is I'll be tracking it as it's going over Central Asia or something like that. And uh, you had a slide where it was over Turkmenistan, yeah, and yes. there's a there's a town in there called Mary, and I just happened mm -hmm. to look at it, uh, zoom down into the into that city. And it was mm -hmm. amazing how much infrastructure is, is there. So uh, not only is it uh, great amateur radio, but it's also uh, great to look and understand our planet better, our society mm -hmm. better, et cetera. It's a uh, fine, fine job. You guys did great. Are there any, um, just a quick question on the, on the process. Are there any regulatory requirements before you could just let a balloon go up? And so, you have to notify people you're doing this or... Yes. That's a, yeah, that's a yes. great question. Uh, oh, do you want to answer it? Uh, yeah, because um, so if you're uh, like a latex balloon, since they go up so high by like 100,000 feet, you have to actually get a no tam from uh from the FAA to pilots in the air to know that it's just a balloon, a civilian balloon is all okay. And with some balloons, like the uh, with the like Qualtex balloons and SBS balloons, if they go over areas where they can't transmit, such as North Korea or South Sudan, then uh, uh, WBA ELK, uh, our good friend Bill Brown, actually has this uh, thing called geofencing, where it automatically turns off the transmission the transmission over these areas where it cannot transmit. Right. And uh, I think the weight limit or the uh, mass limit on that payload you can launch without having an OTAM is like 15 kilograms. Yes. And that just comes from the fact that if some plane happened to come by and uh, our little setup happened to have a collision with that plane, it would be okay because it's so light. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, if we had one of our heavier payloads with a bigger balloon and all the equipment in the box and stuff, we would probably, I mean, there's no way they would be able to know it was us, but it's just morally wrong to launch it without an OTAM. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what does NOTAM what does NOTAM stand for? Notice to Airmen. Ah. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So you um, learn something every day. There's another Air Force guy. <laughs> yeah, when I used to do rocketry, I had to I had to get a, a notice to airmen uh, notice before uh, launching rockets. So it's um, a lot of fun. It really is yeah. launching all these balloons. And uh, real quick, I promised my uh, good friend, she's in the meeting right now. Her name is Linda Meissen. I promised I would give her a shout out. Um, she's working with actually a group of Girl Scouts in the Philippines. Yes. And uh, she's a wonderful woman. And she really wants to get more involved with North Pole and Amateur Radio. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can get her involved more in the club because her story with uh, the Girl Scouts in the Philippines is really, really interesting. So Very good. Can you translate the uh, the weight of your payload or the whole thing uh, to ounces or anything? Or I know you're using all kinds of physics terms, but uh, I understand ounces. Do you have any idea what your payload weighs? Oh, I know in grams. I can tell you what it is in grams. Oh, well, that um, that'd be worth. That'd be all right. What grams? What are we at? Twenty-six grams. Yeah, it's twenty-six grams. That's um, twenty-six yeah. grams. Yes, that's it. That's and less than an ounce, ounce isn't it? An ounce is 28.35 grams. Yes. An yeah. ounce. It's like nothing. Yeah, and uh, we're only working with like, what, six grams of free love, so. Yeah, these uh, PU sets are really, really light. Um, you know, just having one in your hand, you barely even notice it's in your hand, with even with all the um, circuitry on it. And probably the uh, biggest thing is probably the super the heaviest thing on it is probably the super capacitor. Yeah, or the solar panels. Yeah. Or solar panels, yeah. How big so, are the solar, how big are the solar panels? Oh, what like? I'd say like three, uh, <coughs> about 
by three inches? Yeah, probably. Okay. Here you go. Sure. Yeah. Just a couple inches, a few inches on each side. They're very tiny. So good. Fragile. So. The real quick, one other quick question. So, you know, you you you, were no, you had made note of that you you, you feel like you've been very lucky with your balloon's uh, trajectory and everything and hasn't had any incidences. How is there a, a normal amount of time? Did you use helium or hydrogen? I thought I heard you say you used hydrogen, first of all. Uh, we used helium this time. We, yes. we never really used hydrogen, and especially with people. And if you're by yourself, hydrogen is fine, but for safety concerns, helium is better. Okay, so the helium, obviously, uh, I mean, over time, the, the molecular structure of the helium will eventually get out of the balloon, yeah. right? I mean, is there a yeah, typical absolutely. time that yeah. um, that a balloon, I mean, assuming nothing disastrous happens, is it a, is the lifespan of it a, a month, a week, or? I, um, well, usually, well, we're not really sure of the rate of permeation. Yeah. For the balloon. It's very, very small, because this is a special balloon designed to have as low as rate of permeation as possible. But I'm not sure on a specific number on how long it would last theoretically if there was if it was to encounter absolutely no obstacles because I think most of the balloons we've seen have at one point or another encountered some sort of obstacle. But the longest one has gone like what three months? Yeah, I and, think. and the other way you can also go down is through UV. Uh, the UV radiation just ripping out the seam, ripping out the seams that yeah. can also cause helium to eventually just be lost and lost until it, until the balloon just fully goes down. Yeah. So, so I'd be a good experiment. Though. Yeah. Yeah. To figure out how long it takes. How thick is the balloon material itself? Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> It's, a, it's what, maybe a couple yeah. millimeters? A, a couple mils, not millimeters. Okay. Yeah. 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 So less than two thousandths of an inch. Yeah. Trash, trash yep. Microns. It's measured in microns, probably. Yeah. I forget how many mils, the mils to micron conversion. I used to know that at one point. All right. Well, any other questions out there? I got I one. a question. Um, um, do, do you have to do anything to orient the solar panels to make sure you get enough sunlight? Uh, we don't have to. Uh, the, the the payload just spins around, so we can't really do much about it, and it's not in a fixed position. So it so the PicoSat just um, collects light whenever it can when it spins around. Pretty much. So this is the way it should be oriented. So the balloons can be connected up the top up here. As long as the solar panels are facing up, that's all that matters. So it can twist and turn and it has a little swivel that we actually attach here. As long as they're up, it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the only thing you have to worry about. And it, they're soldered into place there. Yeah. So they're not going to move unless something really bad happens, which is possible that so, so based on that, then Jack, um, when you deploy the antenna, you said you guys said you use a, a it's a twenty meter half wave uh, mm -hmm. wire. Do you have it weighted at the free end so that it stays more or less vertical, or do you let it just trail free um, as the balloon travels? Pretty much, it's it's yeah. trailing free. We um, the only thing I would say we stick on at the very very bottom of the antennas would maybe be the excess tape we use during the process because obviously we have to factor every 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 little piece of mm -hmm. everything into the uh mass of that and everything so there's nothing really weighting it at the end significantly it just kind of dangles mm -hmm. so okay. work this far so and what what size it's wire was it again say it again what size wire was it oh 32 gauge magnet wire i want to say yeah it was it, it was very tiny very tiny and very difficult to launch because it's so much to deploy. So, yes. and um, some uh, the University of Alabama actually has a lays out big tarp for the balloon as a, sort of like a runway to have all the wire. Um, so you should probably do that. Um, it's hard yeah. to do on grass, but uh, definitely launch it like if we launch it on like asphalt, pavement, or concrete. Yeah. So 
we just do it in the street of our house and uh, hope to God that no car comes zooming down as we're laying everything out. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. What was the, the biggest moment. surprise? What was your biggest surprise? You guys seemed like you had the trajectory somewhat calculated with air. What was your biggest surprise in the project? My biggest surprise was that we ended up, well, we, the day we launched it, we actually were not at all planning its launch on that day whatsoever. Yeah. Because we looked at the wind predictions. Bill Brown talked to us about wind predictions. And he's like, the wind's going to be too bad. Don't try launching it today. Don't try launching it tomorrow for most of the day. And um, we happened to be up at like 1130. And uh, we walked outside and it was absolutely still. So I would say my biggest surprise is the fact that we launched at the most unexpected time, at the most unexpected day. And still the balloon perseveres. Yes. You know. Before, we always launched during the day in the morning, but it turns out launching at midnight is the way to go. It's the best way to go. It's very still. The balloon went straight up and not into a tree, which was mm. great. Sounds like you might have to write a paper and uh, educate some other people on launch procedures. I Yeah, that's probably in the works. We have a paper on the uh, HABs, but yes, probably should work with Bill Brown to get a formal document out about launching uh, these PicoSats. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to our great friend, uh, Sharon Thomas. Um, she's been a great friend of ours, and we just want to say hello to her. Hello, Sharon. Hello. Uh, hello, I'm here. <laughs> this is wonderful to hear them. <laughs> how, old are you? How, old, how old are Good you? How old are you? hear your voice, Sharon. How old are you guys? Give me you mean those guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jack, Jack and Audrey. Oh, I'm 17. Oh. And I'm 13. Yes. Amazing. There may be hope for us yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I would say the next, next thing to stay tuned for in our balloon discoveries will be a project I'm going to start working on as a senior uh, project for my high school. I will be launching, well, fingers crossed, but as of now, I will be launching an actual HAB, so the ones that go up to 100,000 feet and pop, um, with biological specimens and studying the effects of microgravity and radiation. So we'll see how that turns out. But sounds real fun. Yes. So is, in, are you going to have a recoverable payload with that one? We're going to hope. We're, I'm really going to hope on that one. Um, the last time we launched an HAB, we did recover it, and it was just fine. Okay. So hopefully my goal is to stay with the same model and uh, hopefully recover the specimen and actually be able to do some research with it. And uh, actually, we had some pretty interesting stories um, that we had from um, finding the HEBs on on the ground with parachutes. Many interesting stories have come from those <laughs> landings. Oh yeah, no, there was predecessors for HEBs in our area, and uh, some of them launched and fell into trees and weren't found until five years later by landscaping companies. Other ones went up and popped and fell into a nudist colony in South Carolina. So <laughs> and some hunters found. Yeah, and some hunters found it, which was yeah, weird. But. Yeah, very strange. Um, and in our time, a balloon fell down, and it landed right on top of a trailer house, fell off and landed in the front yard. And we, we only got word of it once the couple came back for, like, a five-day trip or something. Yeah, just sitting there. But and it fell directly on their little trailer house in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. A checkerboard so. of fields in this tiny old trailer house. Yep. <laughs> it just, so, yeah. Well, it's all pretty interesting. Uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is once you put it up in the air, you don't really have control over it. So it's it's just mm -hmm. fantastic watching the thing go. Yeah, hopefully it'll go on for another month, maybe another month after that. Yeah, maybe we'll another see. month after that. Yeah, maybe we'll break a record. I there's no formal record, but we'll make yeah. a record. The Guinness will the Guinness will recognize recognize us soon. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There you go. That's great. Great. Outstanding. So does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to pose to Jack and Audrey? 
Well, Jack and Audrey, thank you very much for uh, putting this together and showing it to us. Uh, you know, we've been watching the thing and hearing some of the background behind it makes it just fascinating. And, uh, you know, it's really great to see that you two guys are uh, doing so much with the uh, STEM approach. And thank you very much to uh, your parents for letting you spend time with us this evening. We look forward to hearing the next story that you've got. So keep going. Okay. Well, we'd like to thank all, all of you guys for letting us uh, speak to you about um, PUSATs and HABs. And mm -hmm. thank you for all the questions that you had for us. Yes. Yep. Great. Thank you. Well done. Yes. Yeah.